the theater of Apollo. Until I know the sure uncertainty, I'll entertain the offered fallacy. William Shakespeare, The Comedy of Errors. It is possible if you fake something to produce a perfect seamless performance in which nothing goes wrong. The problem here is that we do not expect everything to go perfectly at the first time, so it is better to show success but add a few whoops moments into the script. It is precisely what the perpetrators of the Apollo fakery did. Well, they added just enough cliff edge moments to convince the audience that the event was real and that there were excess and risks and danger involved. The Apollo missions were not real life adventures but a theater of deception. It is not even clear how many of the Apollo astronauts, if any, actually reached low Earth orbit. One thing certain, no astronaut ever set foot on the lunar surface as is eminently revealed by the fake photographs and videos supposedly taken on the moon. It is a leap of faith to convince yourself that these images were captured on the moon. So a little quick excitement, suspense, courage, bravery, innovative quick thinking would all add to the drama and make the whole charade believable and importantly more newsworthy. There are many examples of this technique of adding near-death experience in the Apollo story, perhaps even more than would be expected in real life. Trust me, these are imagined incidents purposefully constructed to heighten the tension and increase the newsworthiness. But in reality, no astronaut ever went beyond the Van Allen radiation belts. In this video, we will examine some of the dramatic additions to the Apollo script. Apollo 8 The Apollo 8 mission was intentionally planned to be the second crewed Apollo lunar module and command module test and the first mission to be powered by the Saturn V rocket. The original plan was for it to fly in an elliptical medium Earth orbit in early 1969. That was the plan, but the lunar module was not yet ready for its first flight. The mission profile was changed in August 1968 to a more ambitious command module only lunar orbital mission to fly in late December. In 1968, the Apollo spacecraft program manager George M. Lowe suggested that instead of the planned MEO flight of the Apollo 8, why not send it to orbit the moon? Note that this was only the second manned Apollo flight and the first flight to see the use of the Saturn V rocket, so it would be an adventure change of plan. NASA Deputy Administrator Thomas O'Payne and Apollo Program Director Samuel C. Phillips held a meeting with other NASA area managers who all decided to put the idea to the top NASA officials. At the time, NASA Administrator James E. Webb and Associate Administrator for Manned Spaceflight George E. Mueller were attending a conference in Vienna. Mueller happened to call from Vienna, and when they presented him with the proposal, he was reticent, especially since NASA had yet to fly Apollo 7, the first crewed Apollo mission. He requested more information and more time to consider the proposal so that he could brief Webb while the two were still at their conference. Additional discussions were held later in the week, including with the administrator Webb, who agreed to plan for a December 6 launch, although for a lunar mission, December 20th was a more suitable launch date. No formal decision about a lunar mission would be made until a successful Apollo 7 flight in October, which would prove the spaceworthiness of the Apollo Command and Service Module in Earth orbit. Until then, plans for a lunar mission were kept strictly within NASA. A formal announcement on August 19th stated only that the LM was no longer part of the Apollo 8 flight and that the agency was considering various mission objectives. It is of interest to note that the plan went ahead and that James E. Webb resigned from NASA two weeks later. One has to wonder why the long-serving NASA administrator would offer his resignation so close to achieving the moon landings and fulfilling Kennedy's dream. Is it all probable that the very first manned launch of the Saturn V rocket would go all the way to the moon? Apollo 10 Apollo 10 was supposedly the second mission to orbit but not land on the moon. It was to test the docking and the undocking of the lunar module and test its descent towards the lunar surface. After the second orbit of the moon, the lunar module tumbles out of control. We have our suspense as Gene Cernan, allegedly the last astronaut to leave the moon, describes how the lunar module spins eight times before brought under control. According to Cernan, it was a misunderstanding between two astronauts regarding the position of a switch. There are three very different versions of this event as described in this paper by AWE-130. Apollo 11 The Apollo 11 mission in which Neil Armstrong was supposedly the first human to pilot a spacecraft to land on another celestial body. Does it happen without incident? 
Well, of course not. The media and the public do deserve more excitation than that. As Apollo 11 was in a powered descent to the moon, we had the 1202 alarm from the computer. A moment of high tension, decision, go ahead or abort the moon landing. This manufactured tension is summarized in this video from the Wall Street Journal. This video also provides a good overview of the onboard Apollo computer. The alarm was supposedly triggered due to the onboard computer becoming overloaded and rebooting itself. Seemingly, nobody knew why. So, we have high tension on the very first ever descent to the moon. The situation was further exaggerated by the decision of Mission Control to ignore the computer and go for the landing. The suspense is heightened by the communications that were periodically breaking down at the critical point of the powered descent to the lunar surface. So the story goes that Armstrong decided that the onboard computer was about to land the module in a boulder field, so, like our childhood hero Flash Gordon, he decided to land the module by himself. This BBC News item shows the last 13 minutes to landing on the moon using the capsule communicator Capcom Charlie Duke's audio loop. To add to the suspense, he was critically short on fuel with only 60 seconds worth left to complete the landing. You couldn't make this up. Contrast this with the fact that Armstrong had been unable to control the Earth-based simulator of the lunar module with any degree of competence. He barely escaped with his life as he managed barely to parachute to safety as the craft plummeted to the ground in a ball of fire. Now on to the moon? It does transpire to be easy to pilot the lunar module the very first time in your life that you get your hands on it and when your life depends on it. The suspense does not end there as the tension increases when Apollo 11 came to leaving the moon. Buzz Aldrin notices that a switch had broken on the control panel. This is no ordinary switch but the very one needed to arm the engine for takeoff, nothing less than crucial. If this switch fails to operate, then they cannot turn on the rocket engine and will remain on the moon forever. A thoroughly engrossed plot indeed. Lucky for Aldrin, he has a felt tip pen serpendiciously just the correct size required to ram into the broken switch and save the day. Apollo 12 The second supposed mission to the moon was somewhat less eventful. However, the Saturn V rocket was hit by two lightning strikes just as it launched. The resulting electrical surge knocked out all electrical power, resulting in the inertial guidance system being in an error state and unable to sense their acceleration and altitude changes. All looked doomed for the astronauts, but you can read about their actions in the NASA report. We certainly know that the lightning strike was real as it was witnessed by thousands of observers at the launch pad and captured on the launch camera as shown in some of these NASA videos that are online. We may infer that the rest of the story is probably correct except the moon landing sequel. Apollo 12 became less interesting as Alan Bean at the start of the moon EVA destroyed the TV camera by accidentally exposing the Viticon tube to the sun. So now, there is no color TV camera available on the lunar surface. The public had to follow the whole adventure with no TV coverage of the mission, but only audio. This lack of TV coverage resulted in moon missions losing the attention of both the general public and the mass media. Apollo 13 Apollo 13 is one of the strangest of the recorded Apollo missions. The story of the Apollo 13 missions is a total theater. It even turned out to be a box office hit with the Apollo 13 movie by Universal Studios winning two Academy Awards. It starred Tom Hanks playing the role of astronaut Jim Lovell. Firstly, the background to Apollo 13. Apollo 11 was perhaps one of the widely reported events in history with a TV audience back in 1969 of about 650 million worldwide. Apollo 11 was followed by Apollo 12, 14 November 1969, which simply failed to attract much media attention. This lack of interest was primarily due to the fact that Alan Bean destroyed the Westinghouse Color TV camera at the beginning of the first EVA, as was described above. The major TV networks around the world had to schedule extensive coverage of the Apollo 12 mission for the first time in color, were left disappointed and had to find other material to fill the scheduled time slots. After Apollo 12, world interest in the Apollo missions was at an all-time low, so creating something new and exciting was needed to revive the public interest. After all, seeing astronauts bob around on some desolate grey landscape has little to enthrall one. So, how about a space tragedy which against all probability had a happy ending? 
This space tragedy was to be the story of Apollo 13. The number 13 had omens of bad luck in many Western countries. The numerology was already perfect. The number 13 is considered unlucky probably because of Judas Iscariot, who according to the Christian Bible betrayed Jesus was the 13th guest at the Last Supper. The omen of bad luck was further reinforced by the launch time chosen as 13 minutes past 13 hours U.S. Navy time and the near catastrophic explosion happened on July 13th. It had been estimated that at the launch time, Apollo 13 would probably have landed on the moon in the dark, so not a very realistic launch time. So the bad luck to befall Apollo 13 was written in the numbers. Are you getting the feeling that something may have been contrived? Now to a rather bizarre aspect of Apollo 13. Remember, Apollo 13 was launched on 11 April 1970. Coincidentally, on 12th April 1970, a Russian fleet was on exercise in the Bay of Biscay just off the French and Spanish coasts. To their total surprise, they found an Apollo capsule floating in the area. They recovered the floating capsule and took it back to the port of Murmansk in Russia. The story goes that six months later, the U.S. icebreaker, the Southwind, made a courtesy call to the port of Murmansk. They were surprised to be presented with the Apollo capsule, which was then taken back to the USA and is now on exhibit in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It is probably best to let Apollo expert Marcus Allen outline the Apollo 13 story based on his research. There is yet another explanation of this story from Eddie Pugh, who accepts the NASA story that it was the boilerplate BP-1227 version of the command module lost at sea during testing. Neither of these accounts satisfactorily explain what the Apollo capsule was doing floating in the Bay of Biscay the day after the Apollo 13 launched. The explanation given by NASA that the Apollo capsule was lost during training exercises by the US Navy in the UK waters does not seem at all plausible. Strangely, an important piece of the Apollo hardware had gone missing, but there is no record that NASA ever reported it as being lost. I can find no reference to the UK-based US Navy having trained for capsule recovery in British waters. All Apollo missions were planned to re-enter over the Pacific Ocean, not in UK waters. The inference that this may well have been the Apollo 13 capsule jettisoned after launch could have some merit. As Marcus Allen clearly shows, the astronauts did have a way to escape the launch tower by a slide into a safe room located below the launch pad, and this possibility must be plausible. If the mission was to be a staged event, then why risk the lives of the astronauts? It would be enough for the press and the public to see the astronauts enter the launch tower complex. What happens after this is not observed by anyone. The real question is, was it a real NASA Apollo capsule picked up by the Russians, or just a strengthened version of a capsule known as a boilerplate model used for crew training that had mysteriously been lost by the US Navy? The simple answer would be to go and inspect it at Grand Rapids. Unfortunately, it has been sealed in the manner of a time capsule not to be opened until 2076. You may be wondering why they would keep it hidden for so long. First of all, you need to understand the background of the Apollo project. Apollo 11, the alleged first moon landing, caught the public imagination with an estimated worldwide TV audience of 650 million viewers. The next mission, Apollo 12, was a media failure as we have discovered. People had no interest in listening to astronauts chatting on a distant moon. So some new drama was needed to activate both public and media interest again and keep Project Apollo alive with the money rolling in. The new drama was to be a gripping near tragedy of the Apollo 13 mission. It all started with the now famous phrase from astronaut Jack Swigert, Houston, we, we have, have a problem, problem here. The story goes that there was an explosion in one oxygen tank which ruptured the second oxygen tank causing a total loss of oxygen. Oxygen was crucial as it was necessary for the astronauts to breathe and was also the main component with hydrogen in the fuel cells which provided most of the electrical power. It turned out to be an extravagance of suspense closely followed by the world's media. The Apollo 13 spacecraft would have been rocked off course by the explosion, so how could it get back on course? The Apollo guidance system relied on continuous incrementation and could not fix its position by absolute reckoning. After the blast sent it off course, it would have lost its current location and would have been unable to establish its new position autonomously. 
There is a video from Xavier Pascal which examines what might have happened. Finally, there has always been one aspect of the Apollo 13 story which puzzles me. First, the background. The Apollo project had many technical challenges concerning the heat emanating from the sun. In direct sunlight, the temperature of exposed items in space and on the lunar surface rose to 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 121 degrees centigrade. In the shade, these items cooled to approximately minus 140 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 96 centigrade. The crew capsule had a cooling system to dump waste heat from the CM cabin and electronics to outer space via two radiators located outside of the capsule. During the journey to the moon, the Apollo capsule was always in direct sunlight. In theory, it would heat up to 250 degrees centigrade on the side exposed to the sun. To avoid overheating, one side of the capsule is periodically rotated on its axis to expose the other side to the sun. This rotation was known as the barbecue roll, or to be more technically correct, passive thermal control mode, PTC. Astronaut Alan Bean, when being interviewed by Bart Sabrell, tells Sabrell that without cooling, the spacecraft controlled internal temperature would rise from the climate controlled 21C to 120C. Now we have Apollo 13 coming back from the moon with no electricity to power the cooling system. We see in the Apollo 13 movie that the astronauts almost freeze to death. At first, I thought this was some artistic license introduced into the film to heighten the tension, but no, astronaut James Lovell confirms this, furthermore, it is recorded in the Apollo Flight Journal. A better explanation of this quandary is provided in the video posted on the Apollo Detectives, so I remain confused. Apollo 14 The Apollo 14 mission was no exception to the glitch enhancement that we witnessed in the previous missions. It had two major issues, either of which could have resulted in mission failure. All was proceeding well until the astronauts were carrying out the transposition and docking maneuver. This procedure is carried out just after translunar injection. It involves the command ship pulling away from the third stage of the Saturn V rocket booster, which has the lunar module tucked inside. The command ship then flips 180 degrees so that it is facing the lunar module. Then it docks with the lunar module and pulls it free from the rocket shroud. The transportation and docking maneuver procedure is summarized in this article from Popular Science. The command service module encountered some difficulty in docking with the lunar module. Several attempts to dock the two craft together took place for almost two hours. The problem was with the latching mechanism. Eventually, the problem was solved, but this grave concerns that it may also be a problem when the lunar module ascent stage had to redock with the command module on its return after the lunar landing. If it failed, then the two astronauts would be unable to return to Earth and be left helpless in lunar orbit. Luckily for the astronauts, the latching mechanism worked perfectly on their return trip. The next fabricated glitch occurred in lunar orbit when the lunar module's computer received an abort signal from a faulty switch. This switch when pressed would blow explosive bolts to detach the descent stage of the lunar lander and the lunar landing would not occur. If the problem reoccurred after the descent engine began firing, the computer would respond as if the signal was real and initiate an automated abort. The ascent stage would then separate from the descent stage, the LM ascent stage would have to return to orbit and the lunar landing aborted. So we have a second critical issue which would mean that the mission to land on the moon would have to be aborted. The abort switch issue was a software problem and the NASA software engineer Don Isles, responsible for the original computer code, soon found a software fix as he describes in this video. Don Isles allegedly found a software change to alter the computer program. The story that the software fix involved changing the computer software program cannot be correct as the program was on fixed rope memory which cannot be altered by software. This inconsistency was identified by Xavier Pascal as he describes several problems with the computer software. His logic is somewhat hard to follow unless you are a computer software engineer, but in summary, Xavier sees several logic problems with the software. We have another slightly simpler explanation of the software fix to the Apollo guidance computer from the software engineer and dedicated pro-NASA space enthusiast, Scott Manley. The only other feature of interest during the mission was Alan Shepard hitting two golf balls on the lunar surface with a makeshift club that he had superstitiously brought with him.
Apollo 15. The Apollo 15 was portrayed as a total success with no major incidents throughout the mission except in the final recovery phase. One of the three parachutes which controlled the descent of the capsule into the Pacific Ocean failed to deploy fully. Allegedly, one of these three explosive bolts had malfunctioned, but luckily the other two performed correctly. Only having two functional parachutes resulted in a somewhat heavier impact with the Pacific Ocean than would be expected by the astronauts. Apollo 16 The Apollo 16 mission was affected by two significant problems with the command and service module CSM. The first occurred en route to the moon. An erroneous signal indicating a guidance system gimbal lock was neutralized by a real-time programming change instructing the spacecraft computer to ignore the input. A second problem occurred during lunar orbit when the backup circuit caused yaw oscillations of the service propulsion system. This event delayed the power descent until the engineers had determined that these oscillations would not seriously affect the CSM steering. The result of this unscheduled delay was that the mission had to be truncated by one day. Apollo 17 Apollo 17 was the last of the alleged moon landing missions. There was no need for any extra theatrics as it was the end of an era. There was no excitement except for that one of the astronauts again broke a fender on the lunar rover and improvised a repair with a map. The Apollo story ends there, not with a bang but with a notable whimper. Exit stage left. No Apollo astronaut ever went to the moon, so all of these nail-biting incidents are pure fiction created to embellish the theater of Apollo. I am coming to the view that no Apollo astronauts ever traveled on the Saturn V rocket. My thinking is that given the known unreliability of the Saturn V rocket, NASA X decided not to take the risk of some disaster killing the astronauts. Instead, NASA opted to reduce the power output of the rocket engines to minimize the probability of a catastrophic explosion. In this scenario, the rocket could not have achieved sufficient propulsion to complete the moon missions. The question is, how could such a scenario be incorporated into the deceit? If there was some major accident during the launch and the rocket was destroyed, how could they account for the fact that the astronauts were still alive? I was puzzled how they could have done this until I saw this video of a UK reporter, James Burke, sliding down the escape chute at Cape Canaveral, Florida. The escape chute demonstrates that the astronauts had an easy way to escape the Saturn V while the rocket was still on the launch tower. The Saturn V rocket had a launch escape tower, LES, situated above and connected to the crew capsule. This video from 1964 shows the LS under test at the U.S. Army's White Sands Missile Range. In the event of a rocket malfunction, this escape tower would be ejected off the top of the rocket by powerful rocket engines. Vintage Space has an interesting video on the cue ball which senses the altitude of the spacecraft so that the jettisoned LES avoids collision with the rocket. These two elements, the tower escape slide and the LES, enable us to create a scenario for the deceit. The astronauts would be observed getting into the capsule on the top of the Saturn V before the launch. This TV sequence would either be actual or via a pre-recorded video. The technical staff assisting the astronauts would need to be DIA CIA operatives. NASA X would have had several years to get their people into any crucial roles required for the deceit. The astronauts would then exit safely down the escape chute into the room at the base of the launch pad. Now the problem occurs is if there is a rocket malfunction, how to save the astronauts supposedly in the capsule? If there were no astronauts on board when the Saturn V launched, then there had to be a contingency for saving the astronauts who were supposedly in the capsule. The LES is the system that would jettison the capsule from the exploding rocket. The malfunction may occur while the Saturn V is still in sight or when it has gone out of sight of the cameras. In any case, the LS would be triggered to jettison the capsule and the supposed astronauts rescued in the Atlantic. The astronauts themselves would still be at Cape Canaveral, so any film of the rescue would have had to have been made sometime before, but could easily be broadcast as being live transmission as they did for the moon footage. If there was no malfunction, the mission could then proceed, but without any astronauts on board. The remainder of the mission would be a total fabrication as described in this tome. It would seem to be an elaborate and convoluted scenario, but it would explain how it would have been possible to fake the mission without astronauts being on board the risky Saturn V rocket. 
I am feeling confident that this is how it must have happened, given the research which casts doubt on the power of the Saturn V rocket and the story of the lost Apollo 13 capsule. Not to mention the risk of killing the astronauts in an exploding Saturn V rocket, which if that didn't kill the astronauts, then the Van Allen radiation belts probably would have. At the end of the fake missions, the astronauts, still safely on terra firma, would board a modified C-133 aircraft together with a new Apollo capsule. They would be taken over the Pacific Ocean drop zone, and the new Apollo capsule with the astronauts inside would be dumped out of the back of the aircraft and recovered by a waiting ship. Mission success! The brave astronauts are home, safe, and nobody is any wiser. Creating the Apollo videos! Travelers never did lie, though fools at home condemn them. William Shakespeare, The Tempest. In this chapter of this video series, we will postulate how NASA X created the moon sequences alleged to be live TV as broadcast to the world audience. The techniques used have remained a secret until relatively recently. There is now a better understanding of how they were able to convince a world audience that the Apollo astronauts were really in space and on the lunar surface. It is unlikely that we will ever know the precise details underlying the hoax, but there is sufficient evidence to indicate the general process. At the time of the Apollo project, the inner workings of the development process were little known. All that we knew was what NASA decided to tell us. We had the minimum of information regarding the development problems and little comprehension of the difficulties or the risks involved. It all seemed so straightforward and trouble-free. There were mishaps such as the capsule fire which tragically killed the three Apollo 1 crew, but other than that, superior American technology was winning the day. The live TV broadcasts directly from the moon were the most convincing aspect of the fake Apollo missions. Back in the 1960s, people were easily convinced by what they saw broadcast on TV. If it was on TV, then it must be real. I doubt that this is so easily done today now that we are accustomed to media bias. We now see the many aspects of fake videos and fake news daily. However, we are back when TV was relatively new and people had not yet learned to be suspicious. To fake the Apollo moon landings, the hoax perpetrators would need to create films of the astronauts in space and on the moon. These films could be broadcast later as live TV allegedly coming directly from the spacecraft or the moon. Nobody would be able to detect the actual origin of the signal. In this respect, the astronaut training program played a crucial part in the deception. The equipment designated for training the astronauts had a secondary and essential use in creating the fakery. The two issues to be resolved in creating these films were the characteristics of the moon environment, namely the lesser gravity and almost total vacuum. I talk about using film rather than video as NASA X did make all of the initial sequences on film which were then digitized much later. The moon sequences were captured on film using a slow motion camera running at 144 frames per second. The hoax perpetrators manipulated this film using a digital printer to select the correct frames required to produce the reduced gravity effect, taking into account that the astronauts were also assisted by counterbalancing wires. There had been an endless discussion between the moon landing deniers and pro-NASA group as to exactly how the Apollo mission videos were produced. There appears to be a consensus view by many of the hoax theorists that the film supposedly made on the moon was taken in a studio set here on Earth, then projected at a slower speed to simulate moon gravity. This assumption of only slowing down the projection rate is not correct as we shall see. The actual method used is more complex and we will be discussing this later. The other aspect of filming was that no sound should be audible in the supposed lunar environment. Not recording any outside sounds, in theory, was one of the easiest aspects of the deception to achieve by muting the microphones. Sound travels by vibrating the air, which then travels as waves throughout the atmosphere and causes the eardrum to vibrate. In the absence of any atmosphere to transit the sound, there cannot be any sound. The vacuum on the moon means that any activity by the astronauts should not be audible. As we will discover in video 11, exposing the deceit, surprisingly NASA X did not always get this one right, and this is one more crucial proof of the deceit. Understanding exactly how NASA X achieved the deception is rather complicated. I suspect that this was an unintentional ploy to avoid simple detection. 
It involved the use of various levels of gravity assist by counterbalanced harnesses for the astronauts coupled with a variety of projection frame speeds. The next problem was to set this action against a realistic moon background. They attempted this by using various techniques, including using painted backgrounds, front screen projection techniques, and in some cases, models. We will discuss the lengths that they went in the construction of moon models ostensibly to train the astronauts in a variety of simulators. These moon models were actually used later as a persuasive part of the deception. I also suspect that NASA X might have finer detail models which they never revealed publicly but reserved for their use in the fakery.